Welcome to Soul Reflections, featuring Anna Marie Hribnak, Carol Harkavy, and myself, Stephanie Milan. Enjoy. Okay, well, welcome to Soul Reflections. My name is Stephanie Milan, and I am here today with Carol Harkavy and Anna Marie Hribnak. And today we're going to be doing a special session where Carol and I share chapters from our memoirs while Anna Marie will speak a little bit about mediumship. And one of the really cool things about both Carol's memoir and my memoir is that we both wrote it about our mothers. And our mothers, of which we have mentioned before, both had similar names. Carol's mother's name was Rosie, my mother's name was Roseanne, and my father always called her Rosie. Both of their birthdays were April 5th, and so Carol and I met in this synchronistic event um, in Haddonfield where she met my mother, and it was just a really, really beautiful relationship that began. Actually, it was outside of Anne Marie's daughter's store, so it was very synchronistic. So today we're going to share some of those chapters and Anne-Marie's going to speak. And Carol, I'd love to start with you if you want to share one of your really beautiful chapters with us and then um, I'll take my turn. <laughs> so whenever you're ready. Okay, well this will be from my memoir Rosie and Me. Uh, it's actually the prologue. It's the, the start of the relationship between my mother and myself. <clears throat> Brooklyn, New York, June 24th, 1944. We are getting ready for the wedding. Rosie is bustling around her apartment as quickly as a woman expecting a baby at any moment can. It is her oldest brother's wedding and she does not want to be late. When we get to the beautifully catered affair at the opulent Apirian Manor at 815 Kings Highway in Brooklyn, she greets her mother, Fanny, who turns to her neighbor and exclaims in a whispered voice, that's Rosie, one of my two for shunken doctors, stinky daughters. The other one is over there, Frida. Both of them married to poor schlubs no money. At least Frida's husband, Jack, accepted the kind offer of my sons to drive a truck for the feather factory. But Rosie's husband, Simon? Not him. He was too proud. Told them to keep their crummy job. So what does he do? Cleans dirty clothes in his dry cleaning store. It will be the death of him. No wonder Rizal has the rheumatism. She should have listened to me and married Nathan Birnbaum, such a successful accountant living in a magnificent apartment on Ocean Parkway instead of a walk up in New York. But did she listen? Of course not. But I must admit, her husband is better looking. Rosie overhears this exchange and sidles up to her sister, Frida. Too bad Papa isn't here, she sighs, tears welling up in her eyes. He was so different from Mama. All Mama can talk about are her sons, her zindalas. But Papa loved us just as much as the boy. Papa, how I miss you. Papa, Charles Geshwin, the patriarch of the family, is conspicuously absent. He was at work three years earlier when he died right in the arms of Manny, Rosie's baby brother, who was just 15. Morbidly obese, he dropped dead of a heart attack while tying his shoes. He was 55 years old. Manny runs over to greet his oldest sister, Rosie. Manny, so glad to see you. I can't believe you enlisted and leave next week to go into the army. I am so proud of you. Now that we have the real news about what the Nazis are up to in Europe, we need patriots like you to stop them. 
it was only a stroke of luck that Mama's cousin Itta and her daughter Stella got out. Maybe it was because they had blonde hair and blue eyes that the woman guard in the concentration camp took pity on them and pushed them into the sewer to escape. Rosie beams as she embraces the bridegroom, her older brother, Nat. He has recently returned from San Diego where he was an airplane mechanic in the United States Army. She kisses Nat's newly betrothed wife, Evelyn, who could not look happier. Rosie scans the room and spots her husband's sisters, Sarah and Sophie. Sarah, childless, rubs my mother's belly with a look of envy as Rosie winks at Sarah's husband, Jaime, the lovable curmudgeon. Sophie, effusive and bubbly, always with a smile, rushes over, marveling that the baby has not yet arrived. Any moment now, don't worry, she assures Rosie as Sophie's husband, A.B., nods in agreement. But Rosie isn't worried. In fact, she is the life of the party. With her radiant smile, rosy cheeks, and big belly, she is the center of attention as she dances the Charleston from the 1920s, twirling around with her finger in the air and then wiggles to the newest craze, the rumba, followed by swinging to the music of the jitterbug, also known as the Lindy Hop, named after Charles Lindbergh's hop over the Atlantic Ocean. She grabs Frida and together they rip up the dance floor. It is while dancing that I made a nuisance of myself and started kicking and carrying on, making it clear that we were not hanging around for dessert. I was ready to enter this world and I could not be kept waiting. We only had to go a little over a mile a mere five minutes by cab to Madison Park Hospital where we were supposed to meet Rosie's obstetrician, Dr. Michelson, for what should have been a routine delivery. But he was either unavailable or unreachable, so we were literally in the hands of the intern on call that night. Unfortunately, he probably had not yet completed his obstetrics rotation and because he was either too uncertain or too frightened to deliver a baby, he prevented a normal delivery by pushing my head in with his hand while my mother was desperately trying to push me out. The young intern was hoping that Dr. Michelson would get to the hospital in time for the delivery, so he forcibly held me back until the doctor's arrival. When she realized what was happening, Rosie screamed at the intern, what are you doing? Do not harm my baby. At that moment, Dr. Michelson arrived and after assessing the situation, he gravely told my father, the baby is gone, pray for your wife. But nothing would interfere with the welfare of her baby. My mother fought with all her strength to make sure that we both survived. Our lifelong bond, inadvertently strengthened by the hand of a frightened intern, was created at that very moment. And there was never a time thereafter that I would not have laid down my life for her nor she for me. This was the beginning of a beautiful relationship upon which these memoirs are built. I love that chapter. I really That's do. Beautiful. And it makes me think just because of me delivering soon. <laughs> um, just even moving around a lot and thinking, you know, oh, is this going to be the, the event event, you know, um, makes uh, the baby want to come into the world. 
So I really like that, Carol, and I think it's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. I've told you that many, many times. Um, in my book, I, I've set it up in four different parts, the first being the actual tragedy that had happened to me, the second part being a lot of the, um, I would call them mystical experiences through dreams and connections to the other world that I've had, plus creativity. So I want to share one of those chapters with you guys today. This one is called Waking Up in September. I'm awake. The time is 4.38 a.m. I'm nodding my head as I come out of a dream. Nodding because I just received a message. Who is this message from? An unnamed man. I have a holistic viewpoint of the spiritual world that we're all in this together and no religion outshines another. If one were to call this unnamed man that visited me God, I would be okay with that. Perhaps she would call it an angel or a spirit guide and I would also be okay with it. Maybe she would say it was Jesus, a loving ancestor, a scientist outside of a simulated earth reality or a benevolent being from beyond. The possibilities are endless and I've studied and embraced all of them. The point is he, whoever he is, has a message for me, one that I must sit with for a while. In my dream, I return home to see my mother still alive. She's come back to life. What I'm most worried about in my dream is telling everyone the funeral didn't mean anything because my mother is alive after all. But I am thrilled she is alive and well. We are all so happy, but suddenly my mom gets sick again. Our two-story home morphs into two famil unfamiliar homes. I am standing outside in the night. To my left is a small cottage where my mom is growing weaker. To my right is a white farmhouse where my dad resides. A mighty oak tree is by the white farmhouse. One of its branches scrapes its white siding. A dimly lit dirt path leads from the dark farmhouse to the cottage. My mother emerges from the cottage, failing fast. She falls and I run to her, but I know I can't help her, just as I couldn't help her before. I scream for my dad and he runs out of the farmhouse. I can't go through this again. I can't, I scream as I fall to my knees, sobbing. Please help, I beg to whoever will listen. Save my mom. My arms are wrapped around her, holding her tight. I can see and feel her fading from me, dying right in my arms. But right before she dies, a man's voice interrupts. He is a man I do not know. Suddenly, I am lucid, very lucid. Time stops in my dream. Everything is frozen, including my parents and the large oak tree. Everything stops as though someone pushed pause on the remote control in the middle of a movie. Only the man who is faceless and nameless and I can move. Stephanie, he says, his voice calm, serene. This is what I wanted you to see. I wanted you to see why people don't come back after they die. Why, I ask because the pain of losing them again after they have resurrected would be unbearable to every human. I nod, and then I wake up, nodding. I think this is the first time anyone ever spoke to me directly in a dream. Was this a literal inception? And if that's possible, well, only one person could be responsible, and his name is Leonardo DiCaprio. All jokes aside, the man's voice was calm, yes, but I don't feel comforted by him, as in, this dream hasn't made me feel much better about my mother's passing. What I know for sure is that the man isn't wrong. Having our loved ones return to us seems ideal, 
Come back to me, we pray, scream, and beg. But if our loved ones did return in human form and had to leave us in some other terrible way, it would be too much for us to bear. And as much as I love my mom, I won't be Dr. Frankensteining anyone. I've always believed dreams are powerful, but now I'm beginning to wonder if they serve a much higher purpose than most of us are willing to accept. Maybe the person in that dream was my higher self. Perhaps it was a spirit guide, guardian angel, or God. What matters is I will stop begging for my mom to be back here because while the grief is still here, the tragedy is over and I would never want to go through that again. So. That's beautiful. Thanks. So yeah, that is touching. my chapter, which I, I really um, was very impactful for me. And I know this is really why we wrote these memoirs because of the impacts um, that these events had on our lives, as well as I know what you're gonna be talking about, Anna Marie, how to everyone can be impacted by different mm -hmm. things in their lives. So this particular chapter for me was probably one of the most impactful dreams that I had where everything stopped and it was just so incredible to experience and came at a time when I think I wasn't really expecting it. So that was mm -hmm. really powerful as well. That, that is powerful. Very so absolutely. Carol, do you have another chapter you'd like to share? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that I think both Stephanie and I realize is that um, how cathartic it is to write our feelings down. Mm -hmm. I know that soon after my mother uh, died, I just kept writing and write, I was away we had planned a trip and I wrote every single day for about seven days. I just couldn't stop writing. And people handle grief in all different sorts of ways. And I think that the way Stephanie and I both were able to handle the difficulties and the sadness of first uh, seeing our mother uh, deteriorating and eventually dying was through writing. And, and getting those feelings out. But I, I got a, a wonderful email from a woman who said that her mother, who, who also happened to have the same name uh, and how difficult it was for her. And she didn't, she didn't write, but she thanked me for putting her feelings into words. Yeah. And I, I think that that's what both of these memoirs do is it was a form of catharsis for both of us. Mm -hmm. So on, on, a, on a more upbeat uh, thing, I'm going to talk about how my mother and father met. <clears throat> the love story. Swan Lake, 1934. She is standing at the shore of the magnificent lake dotted with small summer resorts beyond which rise the majestic Catskill Mountains three and a half hours by bus from her parents' home in Brooklyn. She and her girlfriend are escaping from the sweltering New York City summer heat by sojourning up to the mountains for a short vacation for some cool, fresh country air, some rest and relaxation. She is 21 years old, slim, erect, beautiful, and filled with life and enthusiasm. She has described the scene to me so often that I can picture it vividly in my mind. It is a perfect summer day, cool and sunny. She sees a handsome young man rowing a boat on the lake. So in awe of him, she tells her friend, see that man? That's the man I'm going to marry. Her friend laughs and reminds my mother that she is already engaged to a promising young accountant handpicked by her domineering wealthy mother. But she doesn't care. This was the man she would marry. He too had gone to the country to escape the oppressive New York City heat. He and his widowed mother had left behind their Lower East Side tenement and serendipitously ended up 
in Swan Lake. The fact that their paths crossed at all was nothing short of a miracle. Their lives were on two parallel tracks with no chance of meeting, except that they did at an unexpected junction called Swan Lake. Simon grew up in a tenement on Clinton Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where the toilet was in the yard and there was no central heat. His widowed mother brought him and his siblings to America when he was three, right after her 41-year-old husband died in Austria. Because she could not leave her toddler home alone while she worked in a sweatshop and her other children went to school, she immediately registered him in kindergarten, telling the authorities that he was the required age of four. Actually born in 1910, his New York City school record shows 1909, the year his mother told the principal at PS 120, so he would be old enough to register. No birth certificate was expected from a poor immigrant from Eastern Europe. Rosie, on the other hand, was born in America to a wealthy family and enjoyed a privileged life residing in an opulent apartment on South 9th Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. When her family came to America, they lived on Rivington Street, just 10 blocks away from Clinton Street. But they had moved up into Brooklyn and now considered the Lower East Side beneath them, leaving it behind for the Greenhorns. The Geshwins preferred to live in their Jewish upper-class enclave in Brooklyn. How Simon and Rose landed at the same small resort in Swan Lake is a mystery. Some would say that it was beshared, God's plan and meant to be. There is no other explanation. I can picture how their first encounter played out. She, outgoing and lively, approached him after he finished rowing, while he, more reserved, was only too happy to be greeted by such a beautiful young woman. I picture them walking, running, hiking, dancing, and rowing, all the while filled with excitement and merriment, their hearts bursting with the euphoria of young love. She is free of pain with straight, strong fingers and slim but muscular legs, innocent, and ignorant of the pain she would encounter just seven years later, which would plague her for the rest of her life. Uh, basically, the memoir is, is about my relationship with my mother, which is the first reading and how we have such a strong bond. But a parallel story is that my mother uh, faced a lot of adversity because of physical illness. She, she developed uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis uh, when she was only 28 and it, it, she suffered from it for her whole life. So the book uh, really talks about our relationship but also about how she handled adversity in her life. And she was an extremely optimistic person. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from people just saying that and that and, and it's helped some readers who not only were going through difficulty in losing their mothers, but people who have read the book who are suffering also from illnesses that create that cause them pain and pessimism and depression. And I've had some very positive responses where they've said that this book really just gave them the uh, incentive to, to move on in a more positive way. Sure, for sure. Yeah. And I've said that to you before as well in terms of asking what would Rosie do? <laughs> yeah. Just knowing uh, some of the wise words that she had and wise sayings and ways that she looked at the world. So yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I, and I said this to you before about the love story. It just, it reminds me of the notebook and I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. On this it, long lake, you know, so. It's it true. does. It, right. It absolutely does. Yeah. I love it paints that. a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. It really does. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that my chapter then will sort of be a follow-up. It isn't the meeting of my husband and I, but it does have to do with our relationship. 
and it's definitely a more positive spin. So uh, John and I did go to Sedona sometime after my mother had passed and I really wanted to connect with the energy in Sedona, which is very strong, very beautiful energy. Um, I did go through, you know, some self-reflection there and trying to find myself and really, you know, ground myself in the earth. So this chapter in particular focuses on the second vortex. So the vortexes are said to be energy centers in Sedona that are extremely powerful and have the ability to transform energy. So part of the reason why I went there was to visit these vortexes and I write about my experiences in each one. So this one is called the second vortex and it begins like this. Let mother earth heal you. This is the thought I wake up with on the third day of the trip. John and I are going to Cathedral Rock today. Yesterday was the masculine vortex and today is the feminine. There are still a ton of clouds, but we can see a bit of blue peeking through them. John and I make a sandwich for breakfast and are ready to go hiking shortly after. We pack a couple of protein bars and lots of water and then climb into our rental car. Cathedral Rock isn't too far from our hotel. We make a left onto Red Rock Loop Road. The road is long, winding, and has some of the most spectacular views of Sedona I have ever seen. Slow down, I say to John. You're making me miss a breathtaking view. To John, he's just trying to get to the park. To me, he could be going 10 miles an hour so we could take some amazing photos. Do you want me to pull over, he asks. We see how muddy the pull-offs are. I guess I wouldn't. The car will get really dirty. We follow the directions to Crescent Moon Park by making a left onto Chavez Ranch Road, then a right onto Red Rock Crossing Road. A short way down, we see the entrance of the park on the left. Oh no, I say, there's a red stop sign in the front of the gate. The park is closed due to flash flooding. Now what do we do? I don't know, I shrug. I really wanted to go here today. What if the other places are closed also? I don't think so, John says. Okay, should we go to the vortex of Boynton Canyon? Okay, John nods. We need to get more water first though. We stop at Walgreens and then head toward Boynton Canyon. Boynton Canyon is on the other side of 89A. We make a left onto Dry Creek Road and follow that down to Boynton Pass Road. The scenery is breathtaking. The sun is out now, shining onto the mountains and making them look more beautiful than anything I have ever seen. The light highlights parts of the mountains casting shadows on other parts of the land. We turn into the little parking lot at Boynton Canyon, gather our camera, backpacks and waters, and exit the car. There is a bathroom at Boynton Canyon, and the foot of it is close to a resort. Outside, it is sunny and hot, but I wouldn't describe it as dry. Yesterday's rain had undoubtedly left the air a bit humid. As John and I begin on the canyon trail, we see a deer, or at least what we think is a deer. Look at him, I say, watching the deer graze. He has large antlers and he has a grayish white. Is he a deer? I don't know, I say. I think so. Maybe he's an antelope. John shrugs. I'm sure neither John nor I know what an antelope looks like or if they even exist in Sedona. We decide he's a deer and keep moving. The hike up Boynton Canyon is pleasant. I'm grateful for the warm air and sunshine. The air is clean and every once in a while I get a faint smell of pine from the trees. I love the sound of the twigs and rocks crunching under my boots. I feel myself breathing a little heavier as I climb and stop to take some water. Halfway up the canyon trail, I feel a surge of energy but I can't tell if I'm just feeling lightheaded from the altitude change or it's the vortex. I see twisted juniper trees. 
Is this a knoll? I asked John. I have no idea, he laughs. From what I've read about the Boynton Canyon Vortex, it is on top of a knoll. <clears throat> what is a knoll? I don't know. We can't even look it up because we don't have any Wi-Fi. Nope, John says. We stop to take a few photos of one another when we see a man walking toward us with a quick pep in his step. Here's a red rock for you and for you, the man says as he approaches us. It's a red rock from the hills of Sedona and it's filled with love, light, and blessings. Thank you, I say, this is beautiful. If you ever feel unhappy, angry, or sad, just hold this stone close to your heart and remember all the love stored in this rock is washing through you and removing the negative energy. Thank you, I say again. Do you mind telling me your name? It's Robert, he says. Have you two been up this canyon before? No, actually we came to see the vortexes and feel the energy. Well, you've come to a beautiful spot. There are actually two vortexes. That one right there, he points to the taller one, is the feminine vortex. She's known as Kachina woman. There's a story behind her that she's the divine protector of us, a symbol of peace and love. And then there's warrior man, symbolic of divine masculine energy. It's really a wonderful place to be. I'm really excited, I explain the story to him of my mother's death and tell him why I'm in Sedona. Now you see, Robert says, like all of us, your mother had human consciousness. Human consciousness is what causes us to hurt each other. It's the reason we have wars and don't treat each other with love and kindness. Everyone has human consciousness, but we can evolve past it. All we have to do is fill our hearts with genuine love and kindness and spread that out to the world. And as we continue to do this, others will spread more love and so on and so on. And slowly we will change the planet. There are beings all over the universe. And sometimes when we are pulsing out negative energy, that energy reaches them and they just shake their heads and say, Oh, it's those humans again, but we'll get it eventually. That is our purpose as beings on this planet. Love is the purpose. If we invite positive energy into us and spread it to everyone, we can make the world a better place. I agree, I smile. And I want to tell you this, he continues. If you get an idea from the creator, I want you to go with it. Even if it doesn't make sense, even if it doesn't work out the first time, go with it. Try again. That idea is meant for you. When Robert is gone, I look at John. So what do you think of Robert? I think he had some good stuff to say. Honestly, someone else might think he's crazy, but you know I'm all about it. From a practical perspective, when you look at what he's talking about compared to reading people's negative rants and angry hate spreading on Facebook, even if I didn't know anything about what he was talking about, I'd rather listen to what he's saying any day. Agree. What Robert said, the idea from the universe, that's how I feel about the book I'm writing. I have this feeling that I'm supposed to write it even though it's different from anything else I've ever done. That's good then, John says. Yeah, by now we've reached the top of the hill. To our left is Warrior Man, to our right is Kachina woman. I can see why people love this, the balance of feminine and masculine energies. It looks incredible. We snap photos of ourselves, marveling at the beautiful landscape before us. Can I just say you are so beautiful? I turn to see a pretty middle-aged brunette standing with a gray-haired man. Uh, thanks so much, I reply. Just a beautiful girl, I just had to tell you. Thanks so much, I repeat. Is it your first time up here, she asks. Yes, I nod. Then I launch into the abridged version of what we plan to see today about my mom and about the heart rock I just received. Oh, you met Robert, she replies. She says it as though she knows him well. He's a nice guy, she continues. Yeah, I was thankful to meet him. You guys have to go to Antelope Canyon. I write it down in my journal. It's so beautiful there, the man she's with interjects. You guys will love it. 
we'll definitely put it on our list of places to go. What are your names? I'm Lisa, she says. Alan. The woman and I chat about my books. She wants to buy my fiction novels. Then she steers the conversation back to my mom. Did you bring your mom with you? Yes, I nod. I brought her gold name necklace. She wore it every day. I needed her to come with me. That's very good, Lisa says. Also, don't discount any sign your mom sends you, no matter how crazy it seems. She's sending you messages all the time. Just be open to it. I tell her about my mom playing Rosanna on the radio. Exactly, she says, just like that, but there will be tons more. After Lisa and Alan leave, John and I decide to climb higher on Kachina Woman. A couple is meditating by the foot of the rock. John and I sit with them and meditate too. After several minutes, we decide to hike up the rock on the other side a little more. By now, most of the people who have been up there with us have left. It's quiet with only one other couple around and they are at the warrior man vortex. We take some photos of the breathtaking landscape. Below us is a vast green valley. Sedona is incredibly colorful. In this one scene, I can see bright orange reds, browns, and greens against a clean, bright blue sky and puffy white clouds. John grabs my hand. You know I love you, right? He says. Yes, I nod. And I want to be with you forever? Yes, I reply. I can tell he's nervous, and it makes me nervous. Are you proposing, I laugh. It was something we joked about before, but this time John pulls out a ring, gets down on one knee, and at a 10,000 foot altitude asks, will you marry me? <laughs> that was my gender. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. So we had a lot of really wonderful experiences in Sedona and that particular chapter was very synchronistic because it was like, this man came out of nowhere and actually, as luck would have it, I have the Red Rocky game right here. Oh, wow. Great. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's just, it's really, it was such a beautiful day. The whole day was beautiful and the whole moment was beautiful. So, um, and the people, it was just so synchronistic. It was like, we met these people and then they're like, you know, telling us, it felt like everyone had a message that day. You know, everyone had a message and it was so powerful, so. Good, that's beautiful. Yeah. I'm so sorry, we had gone to Sedona. I wish I had read your book first. I don't think I appreciated it as, as much as I should have while I was there. I think had I read your book and realized all of the, uh, all of the, the feeling that, that is right in the rocks, I think I probably would have gotten a lot more out of the trip. I mean, it was beautiful, obviously, but I never had that connection that, that you had. I don't know how time is going, uh, Anna Maria. Should I just read one more uh, thing? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I was, I, there, were, there were a lot of chapters in there that I think people would enjoy reading about my mother's optimism. I was gonna read one on how she traveled around the world just by reading the New York Times. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that for now, but she, she could have led a very privileged uh, life. Uh, instead, she, she married my father who started at, as the delivery boy in a, in, in a cleaning store. So she was, she was just one of the sayings that uh, Stephanie is referring to in the book, she used to always say, want what you have. In other words, don't envy other people, don't wish that you could have more, just, just whatever you have, that's what you should want. And then you can never be disappointed or unhappy. So she was just as happy to travel around the world by reading the New York Times, the Sunday Times travel section. And I do have a chapter on that, but I'll skip that one for now. And this one just, I think, ties up what uh, ties in with the chapter that I just read on the love story. It's called the first yard site. Yard site is a Yiddish word that means anniversary of a person's death. <clears throat> Every year you celebrate it or light a candle or whatever. <clears throat> it is exactly a year since the time I said the final goodbye. 
My thoughts returned me to the room where my mother's coffin draped with a cloth of blue and white dominates the surroundings while the Shomer, ritual attendant, continues reciting psalms, prayers for the dear departed loved one, who is my mother. We are assured that the Shomer maintained the physical aspects of Kvod Hamet, the respect and honor of the deceased and remained in attendance through the night. I enter with reluctance and trepidation, all so new to me, and I approach her coffin for the first time. I place my hand on top of the blue and white drape and suddenly I begin to caress it as if as I had caressed my mother so many times in her lifetime. Gently moving my hand over the draped coffin, my mind transcends time and place. I feel a small smile form on my lips as I close my eyes and see my mother, perhaps in heaven, smiling and walking Yes, walking with none of the physical barriers that prevented her from walking for so many years on this earth. Her hands are straight with beautiful long fingers, piano player's fingers, as she would often say when admiring the fingers of a new baby. And she is energetic, looking for my father. She is carefree and free freed from pain, free from the confines of her wheelchair, free from the dependency of others to perform her most private and personal functions, freed from medications, exhaustion, fear, the smells and indignity of sickness and loss of control of bodily functions. She is walking and running, just as she had described to me in one of her dreams, she is happy. Unquestionably, she is very happy. She sees my father and cries out with joy. See that man? That's the man I married. Hmm. So I, I realize in retrospect, because I really didn't get into discussing afterlife and um, what happens when we pass from this world to the next until compar until after this book had, was published. And um, I think that this is maybe a good segue to going into that there is an afterlife or that there is something there. And uh, I, I wanted to read those too because the first one shows how she met him saying that that's the man I'm going to marry. And then she finds him after she's gone and, and, and uh, confirms that that was the man she married. So. Oh, like that. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, it it's is. Funny. That brings tears. Mm -hmm. just, just hearing you read this and you know, we, we decided on the chapters we were gonna read and then it's like, you wanna shift it a little. So I'm gonna shift my last one as well, but um, it's interesting. I, I wanted to read a chapter from the medium but it, it would be too long. I think that would be a little bit too long for me to read. Um, but yeah, it's it's such a beautiful connection. And um, Carol, I can't tell you enough that that I just, I really enjoyed that book. Um, I think that you just did such a phenomenal job with it. And just really showing your, your mother's optimism and showing how she dealt with this adversity is just, it really is beautiful. And it's funny because memoirs are so interesting. And sometimes I'll talk to people about, you know, well, should I do it this way? Should I do it that way? And I'm like, there's there's different ways to write a memoir, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and mine, I feel like is so different in terms of the way it was written and, and um, the amount of time, you know, uh, to, and the topic as well. Like you, you wrote about your relationship with your mother, but you peppered in these moments of history um, in her life that were, were monumental and, and how it shaped her life. And mine is really about personal growth, you know, and, and grow and 
I would say transformation through adversity. So it's my own adversity as opposed to, you know, my mother's adversity. So, mm-hmm. but it, it just, it's so interesting. So what I decided to do was switch it up because um, I was going to read another travel chapter, which is fascinating, but I think this <laughs> one is, is nice because it kind of ties together again, that those signs, because I feel like in my life, I've really, since, since losing my mom, I've had so many different experiences with just average ordinary people on the street. And even reading the Sedona chapter made me think about it, but this chapter, which is significantly shorter, um, also made me think about that. So I'm going to end with this one. This is, says the last day of May, 2019. My mom is a trendsetter, even in her death. Here I am at the third funeral within a year and six weeks of my mother's death. This time it's for my grandmother's sister-in-law. My mom's cousins decide to do the same trendy service that my mother had, no viewing and a celebration of life at some later point in time. I'm thinking, Wow, my mom really knows how to set a real trend even from beyond the grave when suddenly my dad says it. His exact words are, your mom sure knows how to set a trend, doesn't she? (laughs) While I'm at the cemetery on this sweltering May day, I visit my mom's grave. The lawn crew is weed whacking and I smile. So much for a relaxing, tranquil visit to my mother, I think. My father tells me they are not keeping up with the ground, so he bought a battery-operated weed whacker and cleared the entire area around my mom's grave. I chuckle when I think of him doing that. Now the lawn crew is here, so they must have gotten the message. My dad and I visit my grandfather, Salvatore Michael Melanies, a U.S. Army war veteran in World War II. His grave is about a quarter of a mile from my mom's and has an American flag gently blowing in a slight, almost summer breeze. At Dolores' funeral, I'm crying. Yes, I'm sad for my mother's aunt. My mother's middle name was Dolores but I feel more overwhelming sadness because I think of my mother. I can't keep it together. The tears are streaming down. I look down to see I'm standing on someone's grave, not on their gravestone, but on their actual buried body. It's kind of hard not to do that, you see, considering many of the open spaces at a graveyard are basically on top of buried bodies. I see the headstone in front of me. It says, Vito and Catherine Moles, my great grandparents. I didn't even know I was standing there on top of my great grandparents' bones. It feels weird, but comforting also. It feels like a synchronicity that I would be standing there unknowingly. Maybe they're trying to get me to remember they're here with me, perhaps I'm reaching. Either way, I think about how my family members, I, how many family members. I have buried in this graveyard, and I hope all their souls are together. Just then, my cousin comes up to me. Do you want to hear a dream about your mother? Yes, absolutely, I say. She came to my house, walked right through the door, and she wanted to know where you were. We all knew she was dead, and she knew too. She was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, but where's Steph? I need to see her now. I know she's having a very difficult time and I need to make sure she's okay. It comforts me to hear this dream because I'm having a hard time. I feel like the dead never come to the person, my cousin says. I know, it's so rude. We laugh. Later, I meet a woman at the grocery store. She just kind of comes up to me and starts talking about deodorant. I usually buy men's organic kind because For some reason, the women's deodorants have ingredients that cause an allergic reaction in me. But I didn't tell her that. I didn't say anything. All I did was look in the deodorant aisle. I didn't even pick anything up or look at the men's deodorant when she says, are you looking for men's deodorant? Caught off guard, I reply, well, I mean, I usually buy men's deodorant, but here, she hands me a deodorant. 
she is a makeup consultant, and I guess men's deodorant just happens to be part of her product line. I take it considering buying a new kind has been on my mind for some time. As she speaks to me, she notices my jewelry. Yes, my mom always used to wear these, I say about my thick gold earrings. You said your mother wore this jewelry? What do you mean by that? Well, she passed away a year ago. I knew it, she says. We talk about the loss of her mom and she says she didn't deal with it well. I'm still dealing with it now, all these years later, she continues, and it gave me a bunch of health problems not dealing with it. I tell her I'm doing the best I can, but it's hard for me. It is hard. As I said, I haven't dealt with it, not really. You and your mother were very close. I know it. Listen, you have to keep doing everything you're doing. You have to keep your mom's business and make the jewelry and all the things that you're doing. I can't tell you more than that. I'm not allowed to, but I'll tell you this. God sure is looking out for you. He's taking care of you. So thank him when you can because you're one lucky lady. I didn't know how to respond except to say, thank you. When I tell John about this, he asks me if I asked her why she can't tell me more. I didn't ask, I tell him. I just knew she was connected to something somehow, and I just trusted that. So that's the end of that chapter. Yes, I'm just about <laughs> finished reading Stephanie's new uh, book called The Side of the Dream. And uh, in it, she, she captures the raw emotion that we feel uh, at the death of, uh, in our cases, that the death of our mothers. And uh, you see the transformation from that raw, painful emotion and sadness to the point where she, uh, point of acceptance and reconciliation really with the adversity that the death of her mother brought onto her. And it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful journey because it shows us that we'll never forget our mothers. There's no way that that would ever happen. But that initial painful, uh, raw sadness that we feel immediately after the death can finally subside and then grow into something. As, and as Stephanie said, that it was her transformation from from such extreme uh, sadness to acceptance and uh, really learning, you know, from the experience. So I, I highly recommend her memoir <laughs> to, to anybody to read it. I'm almost done with it. In fact, I was just up to that chapter that she just read, so I'll be able to skip on to the next chapter now that I heard it. <laughs> but it is, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, memoir. Thank you, thank you. Well. Anna Marie, I believe it is your turn to take okay. the stage. It and, is. Uh, we're excited to hear from you as well. <laughs> well, I find it just fascinating um, to share with everyone that's going to be listening to this. Although Stephanie and Carol said that they'd be reading different excerpts from their book, the three of us did not decide uh, what the generalized theme would be other than based on our soul reflections. And um, I sat here listening to what they both did choose to read. And I sit here and I think, will you look at that? <laughs> <laughs> because um, what I do is I live a lot of my life by certain quotes. I just love quotes. I always have. I've enjoyed them since I've been little. Um, when I hear a quote that I identify with and resonates with me, I stop, I write it down. And um, I heard a quote probably about, well, I'd say it's close to 20 some years ago. And it was said by a priest, he happened to be doing just a little mass that uh, he was giving to the teachers. And I was a teacher at that time. And what he said was this, he said, it's only through the heart that one can see rightly for what is essential is invisible to the eye. And I remember when he said that, I was just awestruck. And um, after 
uh, he did the, the mass. I went up and I said to him, Father, would you say that to me again? Because I wanted to write it down. And he did. Little did I know that years later, I would be part of his family and he would be part of mine. Because what happened is his nephew ended up meeting my daughter when they were playing softball. <laughs> <laughs> and they ended up getting married and there I have three grandchildren. So when I listened to the two of you reading about how, um, Carol, how your mom and dad met, and then Steph about you and John, I sat here thinking, isn't it funny how our lives so interconnect? So that's what I, but the quote also uh, is very meaningful to me about the lives of the people that we love, and most definitely about the love that continues when those who have been in our lives pass away. And that's what our uh, initial episode one of Soul Reflections was about, about how do we connect with people? And uh, again, Steph and Carol do not know this, but um, my mom, when she was, um, I had to take her to the hospital. Uh, she wasn't waking up. She had been in the hospital for almost a year. And when we brought her home, uh, she turned to me and she said to me, Ree, don't ever take me back to the hospital. She said, I don't ever want to go through that again. And I understood. You know, I understood. But there was one particular day when I went in to um, be with her, you know, because I'd go in and help eat breakfast and different things like that, but I couldn't wake her up. And so um, I called the doctor and he said, Anna Marie, most definitely you have to get her over to the hospital. And I had told him, you know, she didn't want to go back. She'll be annoyed at me <laughs> if I take her back. And he said to me, he said, no, Anna Marie, you've got to do that. So I did. And um, I can go into the rest of that story in a different way. But when we were there, and as I uh, shared on Soul Reflections, uh, when the doctor came in, they had to put it, uh, something like a CPAP on my mom's face to, to force air in. And uh, she did come back and she did wake up and she lived for another 36 hours. But prior to that, when the doctor came in, he said to her, um, he told her what was happening and he suggested certain uh, things that they would do to help find out what was going on. And she looked at him and she said, and if I don't do those things, what will happen? And he said, you'll die. And my mom turned around to me and she said, Ree, take me home. And so in the interim of all of that, my mother had known, you know, we had talked about it forever and ever, since I was very little, all I wanted to do was be a teacher and writer. And that's what I had always done. And so through the years, my mother would always say to me, read, because my mother was a voracious reader, voracious reader. And she, after she'd finish a book, she'd say, Anna Marie, you could have written this. You could have written this book. <laughs> so, um, so after the doctor walked out of the emergency bay, she called me over and I, you know, she kind of said like this. And she said, Ree, she said, this is your book, hon. She said, write your book and entitle it, The Day My Mother Died. And I looked at her and I said, oh, mom. <laughs> You're done, right? You're done. <laughs> yeah, but that's what she said to me. So um, she did live for another 36 hours. We were able to bring her home and all of that. Mm. So maybe somewhere along the line, I will write that back or that book. I don't know that I necessarily like the title, but <laughs> it was what it was. But um, I want to um, pull this all together in saying that a number of the clients that I work with, um, you know, because I am a counselor and I am a medium, a lot of people do ask why, and Steph, you referred to it also in the chapter that you just read. Why do some people hear their loved ones and other ones not? You know, why do we um, get a visitation when other people don't? And again, I want to reiterate, as I said in our episode one of Soul Reflections, that all of us, all of us have the ability to feel, sense, and see um, in our hearts, most especially in our hearts, uh, the people that we love most. Carol has done a magnificent job of bringing to life um, and giving all of us the opportunity 
to love her mom, to love all the wise sayings that her mom has had, and the beauty of what real love meant. Her mom didn't get married for prestige, her mom got married for love. And it's so evident in your voice, Carol, when you read. Yes. <laughs> Um, Thank you. I did have the opportunity to know um, Roseanne, Steph's mom, and to have seen the bond between the two of them. Um, it was heart wrenching when we knew that Roseanne was passing away. And so, Steph, it's just beautiful for you again to share with so many people the journey that you went through because it was not an easy journey at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it was um, it was so quick that your mom passed. And to have something happen that suddenly does put us in a different type of grief. So I know through soul reflections as we continue with our episodes and people get the opportunity to read both of your books and maybe within the next 20 years, <laughs> I'll write mine. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. Tearing up over here. <laughs> Myself um, together. <laughs> but, <laughs> it is something that we want everyone to know that um, mediumship isn't important because it's just like the quote, it's only with the heart that one can see rightly for what is essential is invisible to the eye. And that's the way people come to us, our loved ones come to us. They come to us in invisible, ordinary ways that really do show us that it's extraordinary the way that they've loved us. So we want to thank everyone for being with us today. Um, we will put out another newsletter for those of you that joined us in the first episode of um, Soul Reflections. For some of you that might be seeing this for the very first time, we'll, um, we'll put information so that you'll know and you can look at the first episode and know that we will also be putting out another episode um, after this one. So we all thank you very much for being with us. Uh, thank you for letting us share the love that we all have experienced with our own moms. And thank you for being part of all of this. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.